Good morning everyone. Welcome to our Sunday service this morning. You are all most welcome to join us as we come together to worship our Lord and our God. We pray that the Lord will reveal himself to you today as we read from his word, as we listen to the hymns, and as we just come together in prayer. Ndia nibulisa nonkengengama lenkosi yetu u Jesu Christu. Ek greet julle elke in die naam van ons Heere, Jesus Christus. I greet you all in the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ. This week we have quite a number of birthdays coming up. So today it's Shirley Pheasant's birthday. Then on Monday the 22nd, it's my birthday. On Thursday the 25th, it's Tersha Vinant's birthday. On Friday the 26th, it's Lorna Elsa's birthday. And then on Saturday the 27th, it's Mark Schroeder's birthday. So happy birthday, everyone, everyone on our list. And also if you are out there and you're celebrating a birthday, happy birthday to you too. We hope that you have a super day and that the here head may be filled with peace and love and kindness and blessings from our Lord above. Let us start by listening to the hymn, We Have Come Into His House. to worship this morning comes from the book of Psalms, Psalms 95 verse 6 and here we read the following. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God. We are the people He watches over, the flock under His care. We come together this morning to come and worship our God, to step into his presence and to bow down before his almighty throne. So as we draw near to him, let us forget about ourselves and our problems and our situations and our challenges and our problems. Let's share with God what's going on in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls, in our situations. Let's focus on God's love and grace as we start with silent individual prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, we come into your presence this morning, for you are awesome. You deliver us out of the depths of despair. You comfort us when we don't know where to turn. You wipe away our tears when all we can do is cry. You pick us up when we fall and when we stumble. You hold closely onto us 
when we feel like we are drowning in this world. You provide for us when we don't know how to carry on. Lord, how can we ever repay your goodness? Thank you for being there for us. Thank you for seeing us, for hearing us, for understanding us and for knowing what we are going through. Thank you, Lord, that every step we take, you are right there alongside us. As we come into your holy presence this morning, we are aware of the things that make us unholy. The times that we are weak and we gossip. We say hurtful things. We make up stories about others. We go around trying to influence people to believe and do what we want them to do. Lord, you know the times we are tempted and we act in anger. The times we are irritated and we answer someone in a harsh tone. The times we are frustrated and we take it out on those around us. Lord, you know the times this week we didn't show your love. The times we didn't show your compassion and understanding. The times we didn't want to see someone else's perspective or point of view. Lord, you know the times where we really just didn't do your will. We come to seek your forgiveness. We come to repent. We come into your holy presence to silently and individually confess our sins to you. Lord, hear our confessions, see our repentive hearts. You know, Lord, how guilty we feel and how broken we are. Forgive us. Let your mercy and your grace flow over us yet again. Cleanse us, wipe away our sins and give us another chance. Thank you that you are the God of second and fourth chances. Thank you that we know your grace is amazing. Thank you that we know you promise that when we repent, you are willing to receive us back with open arms. So receive us back now, Lord. As we come together to worship, Holy Spirit, enfold us. You know what we need to hear today. You know what our needs and wants are. You know in what situations we find ourselves in. Help us to feel your closeness. Help us to experience you today. Help us to feel your arms of love around us as we worship together and read from your word. Speak to us. Open our minds, our hearts and our souls to your amazing presence. We ask this in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're now going to listen to the hymn, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Broken.
has promised good to me. His word, my hope secures. He will my shield and push me as long as life endures. My chains are. comes from James chapter 3 verses 1 to 12 and I will be reading from the NIV translation and so you are more than welcome to follow along with me. James 3 verse 1 to 12 and here we read the following. Not many of you should presume to be teachers my brothers because you know what we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man able to keep his whole body in check. When we put a bit into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body, it corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. When the tongue with a tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing, my brothers. This should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. And here ends our reading this morning. May the Lord bless to us the understanding of his holy word. As you all know by now, 
we are busy with a sermon series out of the book of James. Now, last week we noted that James, this letter is quite easy to read and quite easy to understand. But when it comes to practicing what James tells us, this is where it becomes a little bit more tricky and actually really quite difficult especially when we look at the reading of this morning. But have you ever wondered who wrote this letter? Well, as we page the New Testament, there are lots of people who have the name James. There is James, the son of Zebedee, who was the brother of John the Baptist. There was James, the son of Alphaeus, who was one of the 12 disciples. There is also James, the father of Judas, which is mentioned in Mark 15, verse 40. And then, of course, there's also James, who was the brother of Jesus. And it seems that the majority of the biblical scholars believe that the author of this letter was indeed James, the brother of Jesus. So what do we know about James, the brother of Jesus? Do you remember the story in Mark 3, verse 21? As Jesus was growing up, he lived with his family, with Joseph and Mary and all his other siblings. And he lived with them for around 30 years. They knew him inside out and upside down. They knew what his favorite food is and how he liked his coffee. And then one day, this brother of theirs, Jesus, goes out into the country and he starts doing things and saying things that really, really upset the Pharisees and the priests. Some people start calling this brother of theirs a mess, the Messiah. Others call him a blasphemer. And yet others call him a radical rebel. And out of deep concern for their brother, the family goes to him to check if he's okay, to check if his mental health is okay. And this is the story that we find in Mark 3 verse 21. But when the disciples go to Jesus and tell him, your brothers are here, your sisters are here, your mother is here, Jesus replies with the words, who is my mother? Who are my brothers and sisters? It seems that some of Jesus' brothers and sisters had their doubts about Jesus. However, after Jesus was crucified and he rose again from the dead, many of his brothers and sisters came to faith. They started to believe that their brother truly is the Son of God, the Messiah. Now, James, the brother of Jesus, we read about in Acts. He's mentioned as being part of the group who waited for the Holy Spirit to descend. And then in Acts 15, we read about him again, and we see that he is the presiding elder of fellowship in Jerusalem. He plays a very crucial role here because here the church comes together to make a very difficult and delicate choice in a very crisis type like situation. Because here they needed to make the decision whether they are going to continue as a Jewish sect or whether they are going to break away and become a universal faith that accepts everyone. Because the big conversation at that time was what is regarded clean and what is regarded unclean and how can the Gentiles form part of the followers of Christ. Now, James, as the presiding elder of the church in Jerusalem, would then write letters to the Gentile believers as well as the Jewish believers. He had authority and what he said was quite highly valued. And so he writes this section on the tongue. From what James has experienced, no doubt, from what he's seen as a presiding elder, James felt that one of the major causes of conflict and problems amongst believers is what the tongue does. It's the way in which we as believers communicate with one another, the things that we say to one another, the things that we say about one another behind each other's backs. The words that we twist so that it fits into our recording of a story. This is what James is concerned about. 
If James was living today, he would probably include here the way we communicate with each other on social media, via email, via WhatsApp. James was worried that what the believers said and what the believers did, did not always correspond. Now, before we get into this text, there's an old Jewish story that might help us to relate to this text in a different way. A Jewish woman repeated a story about her neighbor to one of the other women in the community. Within a few days, everyone in the community knew the story. The person she talked about heard what she had said, and she was very hurt and sad. Later, the woman who spread the story learned that what she had repeated was untrue. What she had said had hurt her neighbor's reputation and caused irreparable harm to their relationship. She was very sorry, and so she went to the wise rabbi and asked what she could do to repair the damage. After giving this some thought, the rabbi said to her, go home and wait for a windy day. Then get one of your feather pillows, go outside, cut it open and shake the feathers out. And then you come back to see me again and you bring the empty pillowcase. Surprised by the rabbi's response and a little confused, the one followed his advice. She went home, the next evening the wind came up, she went outside and she did as she was told. The gra wind grabbed hold of every single little feather and pulled it away into the evening's growing darkness until she couldn't see them anymore. And so she went back inside and went to bed. The next day she went to the rabbi, with empty pillowcase in hand, and he asked her, Did you do as I asked? Yes, she said but I'm not sure why you asked me to do it. And I'm not sure why you wanted me to bring the empty pillowcase with me. The rabbi said, take the empty pillowcase and go into the neighborhood. I want you to go and find every little feather, put it back in the pillowcase and then sew it back up. That's impossible, said the woman, almost in tears. The wind took it away into the night and scattered it all over the neighborhood. I don't know where. I can't possibly find it all. Yes, said the rabbi. And that is what happens when you gossip or tell a story about someone else. Once you talk about someone, the words fly from one per person's mouth to another, just like those feathers flew in the wind. Once you say them, you can never take them back. Once a word is spoken, it cannot be taken with this statement in the back of our mind, let's see what James is trying to communicate in this reading. In verse 1, James starts out by stating that not everyone should presume to be teachers because those who teach will be judged more severely. What is James referring to here? It seems that many individuals within the church community wanted to show their superiority, wanted to show their great intellect, wanted to be placed on a pedestal by others and experience power by teaching others what to do and not to do. It seems that one of these individuals thought that they could do even a better job than the apostles that were actually sent to the community to preach for them. It also seems that many of these individuals were very quick to judge, to make comments and to reprimand others, especially if they didn't like them. Now, this problem was a universal problem the early church faced because back then there wasn't really any structures in the church like we have today. The church was still developing and so anybody could stand up if they wanted to speak in the church and they could. But this created a problem because people would stand up and they would make statements that caused infinite harm to others. They made statements that some would regard as false teaching and false doctrine. And they would make reckless utterances that caused major, major conflict. And this was something James believed needed to stop in the church. 
as he states in chapter 1 verse 9, listening to each other, understanding each other's point of view is a lot more important than speaking, getting angry and forcing others to see your side of the story. This concept continues to be important for us because it can influence our relationships. The relationship we have with our partner, the relationship with our friends, the relationship with our children and our grandchildren, the relationships we have with one another as believers. It's important for us to listen to each other, to hear each other out and to try and understand one another before we push our ideas and our wants and our wills onto each other. In other words, we should listen to understand and not listen to respond. Many of us knows what it feels like in these situations. When we listen to answer back instead of listening to understand. When we do find ourselves in these situations, we often say something before we can think about it. And then we hurt someone with our words without really meaning it. Once it's said, we can't take it back. We can't make it unsaid. We can't cancel it out. The party who gets hurt will always remember it. Often it will be told to others. And often the story will get lots of other tidbits added to it. And the whole issue will eventually be taken out of context. And then it will start gaining momentum. The point Jay makes in verse 2 is that not any one of us is perfect because if we were we would be able to control our whole bodies and keep our tongue in check it's a universal dilemma saying something in the heat of the moment it's saying these things in the heat of the moment that so often causes and begins conflict and tension in our relationships James uses a whole list of analogies to explain exactly how important the tongue is even though it's such a small part of our body. He starts out with the image of a strong, powerful horse, a great animal who we control by placing a bit in his mouth. As soon as the bit's in his mouth, we control whether the horse goes right or left. James also uses the image of a ship steered by powerful winds that blow over the ocean. But the small little rudder steers the ship into any direction. Like the small bit and the small rudder, our tongue is a very, very small part of our body. But it has power. It can steer us and control us to go in a direction with what we say. Then James uses another image. The image of a fire that burns down a forest. It may have been a very, very small spark that started that fire, but the consequences are grave and great. Because once the fire gains momentum, it is unstoppable and it destroys absolutely everything in its path. In verse 6, James states that the tongue corrupts the whole person. The tongue can set the course of our lives on fire. When we gossip, when we talk ill of someone, when we answer someone with our thinking in the heat of the moment, or when we try to impose our will and our wants onto someone else without first trying to understand their point of view, or when we are upset with someone and then we go around spreading stories about them, then it is often the start of further evil. With our tongue, we say what is in our hearts, and what is in our thoughts, whether it's as positive or negative. Often with what we have to say, we can either, we make either our own lives or the lives of others a living hell. So even though the tongue might be a very small part of our body, just like a little spark or a rudder or a bit, it can have a powerful effect and it can corrupt us. Remember, the tongue can be the rise and the fall of nations, mankind, and can control love and hate. James then refers to animals, a variety of different animals that man has tamed. And he also says 
that no man can tame that tongue. In verse 9 to 12, James then makes an argument. <clears throat> How it is possible for us to use our tongue to worship God, to pray to God, and yet moments later we use that very same tongue of ours to curse our neighbor or our spouse or our fellow believer or to gossip or to stir up hate. Surely that doesn't go together. So what is the point that James is trying to make for us in this reading for our context today. What we say to and about each other has power. What we say to and about each other can deeply hurt each other. What we say to and about each other can cause damage in our relationships, which in turn influences the whole congregation. Negative vibes begin to grow and then this results in hardships for the community of believers because it creates disunity. Disunity <clears throat> results in division. Division grows into divided loyalty. Divided loyalty grows into conflict and conflict eventually grows into hate. And this is not what the church should be, is it? So what must we do when we differ with one another? What must we do when we are hurt by someone else's words? How should we deal with it if we are confronted with people coming to us to gossip to us about others? Perhaps the poem Three Gates written by Beth Day can help us. She wrote, If you are tempted to reveal a tale to you someone told about another, make it pass. Before you speak, three gates of gold. The narrow gate, first, is it true? Then, is it needful? In your mind gave truthful answer, and the next is last and narrowest. Is it kind? And if you reach your lips at last, it passes through these gateways three, then you may tell the take nor fear what the result of speech may be. We sometimes find ourselves in situations where we have to speak out against statements that are made. But speaking out against a statement doesn't mean we have to attack the person making those statements. As believers, we always need to work with one another in love, even if we don't particularly like each other in that specific moment in time, in that specific conversation. When we feel that a misunderstanding is approaching, we need to really try our best to sort it out as quickly as possible. We always need to be mindful when we speak and communicate to one another in any way or form that what we say is true, that what we say is needed, but most of all, that what we say is kind. Now there are days where we get this right better than others. Days where we are irritated and frustrated or we hurting or we are in pain and often words then slip out unintended. Yet they still cause hurt and they still break relationships. So it's imperative for us to always reflect on our day. Did I say something to hurt someone? And if we realize that we did, we need to go to that person and apologize. When we receive an apology, we also need to be open to forgive, as we know that all of us can sometimes have a bad day. The tongue can be very dangerous. And it's interesting that Augustine, one of the early church fathers, when he looked at this passage, pointed out verse 8. In verse 8, it says that no man can tame the tongue. But Augustine underlines the fact that it says, no man, not nobody, because God can tame our tongues. And so we need to go to God to ask him to help us do this. As we are now in the time of Lent, so many people are giving something up. Chocolates, cake, coffee, coke. 
But how about we try to give up gossiping and hurtful words, spoken and written, for this time of Lent? Let us try to speak when it is needed, but to do so in kindness. Let us try to hold our tongue when a juicy gossip story comes across our ears. Let us try to encourage and lift each other up rather than break each other down and hurt one another. God's grace for us is amazing. He understands and he knows that we won't always get it right. But when we truly try, God will help. God will inspire us with the right words at the right time. But we have to pray for his wisdom, discernment and guidance in every conversation that we have in this Lent time. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, we come to thank you for your amazing grace and understanding. We come to thank you for your unconditional love and words of encouragement that you give us. We come to thank you that you walk with, talk with and look after us. Lord, you know how often our tongue gets the better of us. You know how often we hurt or get hurt due to the tongue. But Lord, we know that you are the one who can tame our tongue. And so Holy Spirit, as we go through this week, as we chat with different people, as we write WhatsApps to each other, take charge and hold our tongue so that when we do speak, we only speak in love and kindness. Help us to unite and not divide. Help us to love and not to hate. Help us to reconcile instead of breaking away further. Help us to forgive and to not hold grudges Help us, Lord, to follow the example of Christ and to love all who come across our path. Lord, you know us inside out. You know the struggles, challenges and problems that we have. You know what this week ahead of us holds for us. Be with us every second of every day and night. Help us to feel your comfort when we are mourning and sad. Help us to feel your hope when we are despondent. Help us to feel your peace when we are stressed. Help us to feel your love when we are broken. Help us to say the right thing at the right time as you guide us with your wisdom. We come to pray for all who are undergoing tests and waiting for results. We come to pray for all who've received very bad diagnosis. We pray for all those who are ill. Lord, bring healing. Place your hand upon those in our congregation and in our families who need a miracle. We come to give thanks for those, Lord, that you've carried through a medical procedure this past week. We come to praise you that there were successful operations and vaccinations are beginning to be given. Thank you, Lord, for these blessings we receive from your hands. We pray especially for the Christie and Whitfield families after the loss of Malcolm and Alfred, Lord, wrap them in your arms and bring them the peace and comfort that they need during this time. Lord, we also come to ask that you will open your heavens and send us rain. You know what the water situation in Port Alfred is like, Lord. You know how difficult it is for us and how quickly we get upset because there is just no water. We ask, Lord, that you will send rain to fill our tanks and our dams so that water can once again flow out of our taps. We ask, Lord, that you will be with our local municipality who perhaps needs to fix a few things. Help them to do that, Lord, so that we can have water again. Please, Lord, so many of us are struggling and so many of us are despondent because of this water crisis. So please help us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we can come to you with all our requests, all our problems, all our challenges, and that you always remain faithful. You remain awesome. You remain always the same, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Thank you, Lord, that we can be called your children. Amen. We're now going to end off with a hymn 
glorious things of thee are spoken. Babalo lenkosi yetu u Yesu Kristu utando luka tiko obutlelwana lo moyo u yinkwele malube nani nonke en nou mag ik van Christus die liefde van God en die gemeenskap van die Heilige Gees met akend van die lewees en bly and now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all and with all those whom we love now and forevermore. Amen. May you have a good week this week and we'll see you next week for another virtual service before we open up on the 1st of March, uh, the first week at Sunday in March, the 7th of March. But our YouTube services will still be coming to you, so we'll see you soon. Have a good week.